Let's review 12 Rules for Life, an Antidote to Chaos by Jordan B. Peterson. Henry Adams once said, Chaos often breeds life when order breeds habit. This is a complex relationship that chaos and order have together. Just like vice and virtue, law and order, and the Tao. Summing this book up, it is intellectually downplayed and edited to the normal masses, since Jordan is a psychological and intellectual charismatic genius. He cites the Bible as well as Disney characters to help the reader relate with order and chaos, helping the reader to deal with the uncertainty of the known. Jordan's fine print is the truth versus the ideological. Breaking everything down to get to the truth, lying to yourself or when leaders are manipulating and using deception to convince the zombie masses. Jordan in real life is very charismatic, talkative, he flows when he talks, he's very genuine and he wants to offer help. He's capable of direct advice which can trigger low frequency zombies. At times he's philosophical or intellectual. DB researches the gulag out in Russia, Mao, communism, and these are great proponents to his reasonings. Why feminism and socialism are not okay. Although you do need, he emphasizes a social contract to have order, not just chaos. Consider the chaos and order a dance or a balance of yin and yang. Jordan appeals to young men in real life as well as in this book. You can see Jordan Peterson crying and explain his care for what's currently developing in culture. It makes him very likable. Here's a small clip of him on a radio show. The, the fact that suicide is the biggest killer of young men under the age of 45 in this country. It goes on in that interview to say, at this point, to my astonishment, Peterson begins to weep. He yeah, well... It says, see, now it did it to me again. Look, last night, you know, I was at this talk I gave, and about a 1,000 people came, and about 500 of them stayed afterwards, and most of them were young men, you know, and just one of them after the other comes up to me, and they shake my hand, and they say, look, I've been listening to what you've been saying for six months, and it's changed my life. It's like I was depressed. I was addicted to drugs. Uh, my relationships weren't working out. I was hopeless. I didn't have any goal. I started cleaning up my room and telling the truth and working hard on myself, and it's really working, and I just want to thank you for helping me. And I thank God. It's so, it's so sad that so many of these men, you know, they've not had an encouraging bloody word, a real encouraging word in their entire life. It just takes a little bit of, of encouragement and care so that they're willing to set themselves straight to some degree and start trying. It's just a catastrophe that that's... That's so rare in their lives. Very fast, where sometimes it doesn't make sense or he's jumping to conclusions. I put him in the realms of Sam Harris, Gad Sad, or Nassim Taleb. Whereas in terms of Activision and his truthfulness and his willing to fight, such as James Damore, Mike Cernovich, or Dave Rubin for free speech. He makes it a point to be very careful what he says, since there are many people to attacking him from all different angles trying to repress his views and to slander him. He never apologizes which you can learn from social justice warriors always lie by Vox Day. In a sense, he's like Milo, yet he's more likable and he understands the game that they're playing. He has a little bit of sneaky satire that is hard to pick up. He really started getting famous when I guess the Canadian government started to push these gender pronouns on him to use. And he fought back and says, I'm not doing that. So he's a rebel. He gets in trouble for talking about the masculine and feminine, dropping light grenades of truth bombs. The alt-right, as well as the Manosphere, typically like him since he's somewhat of a warrior, but he has to deal with the backlash. The MGTOW tend to be bitter, but okay with him since he uses these comments. But he did apologize. Is there a concrete example of something where you, you, said, you said something, and I'm not thinking of anything in particular. I'm being ge entirely genuine here. It, is there an instance where where you feel you said something that, that uh, appeared to be true to you at the time and knowing what you know yes i think i was a little i think i was a little dismissive of the men going their own way because i think i called them pathetic weasels which and i had my reasons for that my reasons were roughly speaking that who, I, who are the men going their own way oh, just for context well they're a group of people mostly on the net who have had who've been burned in their relationships or who conceptualize themselves as having been burned in their relationships. And they believe that the legal structure in particular in Western countries is so tilted against men, particularly in family dispute situations that, and divorce settlement, that it's safer for men not to establish permanent relationships with women. 
not to cohabit with them, ever. And they're a large movement. Now, how large they are, I don't know, but they're large enough. And they have what I would regard as an undue influence over relatively bitter and resentful young men who haven't had great success in the dating market and who are looking for a rationale to write off all women because they've they're so hurt by their continual rejection. And that is not good for those young men. And so the reason that I disparaged the men going their own way was because I had seen the pernicious effect, these are often older guys, the pernicious effect of their uh, world-weary philosophy on young men. Now, these guys think that they're just warning them, and they are warning them, but they're not just warning them. Now, the reason I re regret calling them pathetic weasels is because they also have a point. I do believe that the court systems are staggeringly anti-male, absurdly, horribly anti-male. And I've seen my own clients, some of them who are really, really decent, hard-working, family-oriented people, demolished by the court systems. And, and so the men going their own way have a point. Um, and so I'm sorry that I called them pathetic weasels. But I, but I outlined my reasons, and so yes, I do regret that. I have to be careful because I do have a satirical, dark, satirical sense of humor, and I can utter epithets, let's say, for the sake of punctuating a point, while simultaneously forgetting that 150,000 people will listen to it. So, so I regret that. Once you acquire these truths, he makes it a point to avoid meaninglessness and nihilism since religion is somewhat not being hammered to people's brains as in back in the day we have more access to information. I will be reviewing the Maps of Meaning in his other book at a later date. And a point before I go through the 12 rules is he expresses this being with a capital B. And what that is is from the, from the philosopher Heidegger. It's a reality conceived objectively and in totality of the human experience. So the being is really the truth or to be, not to be fake or to, to be broken down to the truth. I would consider this a book of truth or pathway to the truth for yourself that you could use in your own life. Rule number one, stand up straight with your shoulders back. This was very surprising to see that this intellectual was going to talk about lobsters of all things. So this is the lobster chapter. I would translate it to more of like Tupac, keep your head up. So his example in nature is lobsters. And what lobsters do is they're mating rituals. There's a dominance, somewhat of a hierarchy in order to mate with females. What this mainly concerns is the neurochemicals that are spit out when a lobster wins or loses how the lobsters behave so they can get aggressive they will fight so the biggest lobster almost always wins or gets eaten so the lobster that loses there are chemicals that are produced for loser lobsters the big lobsters the ones with high status and say social proof win it's a dominance parade to get what you want so the butthurt lobster gets low serotonin which keeps it unhappy and for what jordan peterson says this can snowball to bad luck bitterness and that low status people don't live a good life and by being kept weak there's anxiety and it's what these evolutionary psychologists it's somewhat of a, a wacky logic that they come to these conclusions but he's just using these as an example is i see it as no one will ever love a beta male that is why there's game he has a dark sense of humor a sad tormenting but this is a good example of, in life, you want to be somewhat proud. Being treated badly affects your hormones, affects your life. You're not going to live a very quality life. People do size up each other, just a, a normal human behavior. And in order to never really have this lowness in life, you got to speak your mind. Rule number two, treat yourself like someone you are responsible for helping. This is just another way of saying a more sophisticated way of saying doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. How do you want to be treated? I see this as don't be evil to other people. There is a part in this chapter where he's saying women shame men to be self-conscious. Do this resentment that men feel in rejection. 
that they're not mate potential, it could ruin their self-esteem. And it's a way of getting men to do what they want. It exposed flaws. Flaws have been exposed. People can die by death. People attack people with big egos or that are, if you're arrogant or if people are just looking out for themselves, that this is something to look out for other people, not to be so self-absorbed. This is more like first world problems. All this is to strengthen the individual at the end of the day and not really sacrifice yourself. This reminds me of Ayn Rand's virtue of selfishness. And what Georgia Peterson gets blamed for is people land blast him and blame him that he's helping out the alt-right. He's just helping out other people. How the media and bad people treat him is something that you can learn from this statement is to treat people and help people. Don't be a nice guy. Don't victimize yourself. Be somewhat of a service to others. You still have to be selfish, but in order to help people, it creates respect. Just having a deep respect for people. Rule three, make friends with people who want the best for you. Very somewhat self-explanatory. You want to be around people where you can learn from or transform themselves into the positive being. And he does point out that the highest virtue is a desire to help. And I don't believe that's a very strong virtue. You could end up being like Catcher in the Rye. There's better virtues than that. Jordan does point out that helping people, there might be an issue behind that. When someone is helping you, are they doing it for their own good? Are they doing it to actually help something that's actually real? He calls it blind ambition. I would call it blind, empty ambition. All of this is to protect yourself from, to quote Jordan P Peterson, use your judgment and protect yourself from too uncritical compassion and pity. Rule four, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. Very self-explanatory. Be an individual. Don't compare yourself to others. You're never going to be the top person at every moment. The problem with this is people that are stuck in their own head, especially with people living in cities. They're gravitating to cities because that's where the jobs are. Especially males, they're not able to go outside and be out with nature. They might be scared of a ladybug at night, so you never know. So this is what's kind of happening with men. There's a hierarchy, of course, and hierarchies are not necessarily that bad. And people can get attached to the status quo or to or to always want to be in the top dog. You're going to lose. It's just a part of the game. And now there's, especially young people, are not developing any sense of self with the digital arena, how many followers you have, how many subscribers you have. It doesn't really matter as long as you feel self-confident you have experiences in your life. This is, it's going to be a problem more with people getting almost addicted to social media and Instagram, that you can get caught up into lies and delusion. You could rig yourself into being, trying to be that top performer with a million subscribers that you will do anything to keep that status when your self-development, self-growth can happen through other ways by reading or doing rites of passage, taking up challenges. And a big point that Peterson is thinking about other people is that religion has kind of gone down in the Western world. And without that, you're going to have more people dropping into nihilism and meaninglessness. For instance, I say that man is a spiritual animal. And if you're just intellectual, what can happen with many of these intellectuals, then they will most likely dip into this atheist, nihilistic, meaningless mindset and lifestyle. Then he goes on to say this trinity, it's arrogance, deceit, and resentment. I put that into the realms of the dark triad almost. That was Machiavellism, psychopathy, and narcissism. And these are blinders, much like vices or more of a zombie culture of idiocracy. To have live almost an aimless life. And what you aim at determines what you see. And it's important not to have this short-term mentality where you want the quick fix, the short success, or always looking just for the shortcut, nothing, a substance, or hard work. To understand and build for compound interests. You got to use your eyes and have good vision. Bad vision is good vision. So you get to look into your own personal darkness and have awareness of beliefs of what you believe in. Are you acting out on them? Are you rehearsing your behavior? Are you paying attention to your own behavior? Are you being irrational, childish? Are you making yourself stupid <laughs> by doing dumb shit or just doing mindless stuff in the city? Go out and do some challenges. Go out and do shit. Rule five, do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. This is a complex chapter. I will give my best. I do not have kids. So there are going to be other people that are able to give better advice as well as to review it. So I'm just warning you beforehand. Kids do provoke and it is the responsibility of the parents to say no to kids. I know that's easier said than done. And no can be a powerful world. There's freedom and discipline and there are boundaries that have to be enforced. There is an issue with single mothers rising. 
this behavior is being rewarded and we shouldn't really be rewarding bad behavior. It's just the wise thing to do. We should never be overprotective of our kids. The people are gravitating towards cities. I'm just gonna use an example. Playgrounds are becoming soft. You can get lawsuits for a kid hurting themselves on the playground. So if you notice they're very pat well padded, there's nothing too dangerous. You have to go into say a parkour gym or out deep in the forest where you gotta take responsibility for your own self. This being overprotective and I think they call it the helicopter parent. Don't be weak in your words, be strong. I did say that he uses Disney examples. I don't like the use of some of the Disney examples because they're cartoons. They're good for stories. However, it's just really weird to me that he did it. That Sleeping Booty was lonely, rejected, and suffered depression. So th the parents of Sleeping Booty weren't good parents. And it was obvious that Sleeping Booty couldn't really do shit for herself. She was just kind of lost. Uh, that's the point, just being a lost soul. I do like some of the words he uses. It's called dis use discipline techniques, glares, verbals, a thumb clock flick of the index finger. So he's obviously more that psychological, I'm in charge. Um, he understands all the psychology techniques. Uh, it comes with the territory of to being an actual clinical psychologist. There are attention seekers on Instagram. That's going to hit people hard because it's like an aimless area. And here are three rules for parenthood. Limit the rules. Use minimum necessary force. Parents should come in pairs. So that pretty much means no to single motherhood. And I'm glad he points this out that this is a huge issue that is going on in America, especially this area, California, where I live. You're going to see in the next 5, 10, 15 years, you're going to see a lot of females that are not married. They're trying to wait till late 20s to marry, and that's just not going to fly in a, a culture. You're going to have a backlog of unhappy, unmarried women. I did do my best for this chapter, but it is something that for older people, people with kids to understand. Or when you have kids, it's good to look at this chapter and review. Rule six, set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. I put this as, you don't think your shit don't stink? It is always important just to look at yourself, see how I can improve or lead by example. Not just blame everything around you. Act like a complete victim. You don't want to get caught up into evil, nihilism, random pleasures, or ignorance. There is no utopia of blissful ignorance. There's always nature's going to find a way. His main proponent for this chapter, I think, is because of the social justice warriors attacking the hell out of him, increasing his notoriety. That's how I found out about him, is the whole gender pronoun scandal. There's outrage in the world, and these social activists, these social justice warriors, use the bully victim tactic on people. Completely irrational when they don't even have their shit together themselves. So go outside, don't watch any TV, no fake news, read books. It is too easy to fall into this victim complex and it can be hard to get out. So I do think leading my example and waking up, being more awake than the sleeping elephant, I think will set you on a better path. You don't want to get caught up into resentment or become a monster that you hate, that you hate something so much that you become the monster itself. Almost being a politician, you have no game plan yourself. So clean your room, which I should do too. <laughs> At least my car's clean. Don't blame God. Listen to earthly wisdom. There are people in the past, they've written down stories for others to learn and keep your soul alive. Rule seven, pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. The main point of this chapter is suffering is inevitable. Don't be distracted by the quick fix, especially in a world where speed is king, Google. You can get knowledge from Google at the click of a button. With technology on hyperdrive with the Moore's Law, instant gratification is a huge issue. That it's good to have a delayed pursuit or delayed gratification, not just instant gratification. We have the Instagram likes and attention inflating the egos of Instagram chicks. Then you have guys with instant gratification of porn. This is not a meaningful life. Go for meaning and what's purposeful. You have to work don't pursue equality, and this pisses off the social justice warriors, especially with feminism, just railing on equality for bullshit things. You have to let go. Don't turn to evil into this angry witch or pathetic douchebag, despite the envy and hate. Go for meaning and merit, self-actualization, and the best that you can do. Don't tear down people with the rules for radicals. And culture is becoming heavily narcissistic, and this is blatantly obvious, that there's unlimited sensual gratification. There's a number of ways to get this fix. Don't get caught up into the win or loss, like the Tao. There's no grasping it, so you never lose. 
That is a very good concept of Eastern philosophy. Have some discipline because freedom requires restraint. You don't want to be a cynic that can't escape from its own reality. There's going to be suffering, all these religions. And in other words, suffering is inevitable. Don't think short term. Go for the long game, the long tail. Be patient. Don't avoid responsibility. There's meaning in life. At least wake up and don't be a zombie. Rule eight, tell the truth or at least don't lie. The risks that 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 accrue to you for for speaking the truth are so much more minimal that, than the risks that accrue to you from deceiving yourself and other people that they're not even in the same universe. And, and I actually understand that because I've studied how deception and deceit and twisted language corrupt societies into murderous and genocidal entities. I've studied that for 40 years. And decades ago, I decided that I was going to do my best to say, to speak the truth as clearly as I could formulate it, and then to let whatever happened, happen. That's a kind of faith, eh? you know, I mean, the idea of religious faith is, is not a particularly popular idea among intellectuals in the modern world, but that's partly because they don't really understand what it means. So, so here's, a, here's, a, here's an example of faith. So you say, well, if you speak the truth, imagine that the universe is constituted in a fundamentally positive way. I mean, perhaps it is and perhaps it isn't. We don't know, but imagine for a moment that it is. And imagine that the only way that you could get access to that positive element is by telling the truth. And so you can decide that you're going to run your life like that. And instead of using your language to manipulate people and to get what you want, you can use your language just to represent what you believe to be true and to listen to others while you're doing it and then to watch and see what happens. And it's obvious he's really talking about politicians and bureaucrats. For instance, politicians lie to get things done. That's normal. That's okay. However, bureaucrats can lie, manipulate, and deceive the world around them to keep people weak and into a trap. I still have to read these books, The Gulag and what's go went on in Mao's China and anything to do with communism that bureaucrats aren't really worth listening to. They're really just manipulating the world. And people get caught up in this willful blindness. The bureaucrats can have this easy rationalizations that you have to be able to pick up. There is no utopia. Lies can wreak havoc, jealousy. You can lie to yourself eventually. And there's so much fake news around that. Why even pay attention to the news? Everything's about books, maybe YouTube, certain things. Don't get caught up in the journalism. Go outside, go to travel to other countries. There's fake news and there's also fake history. And the big point that Jordan puts out there is that these laws and rules that these dictators and bureaucrats put is you were putting up with them. You let them put up that rule to rule over you. So don't let these rules convince you of anything. Don't even care about them, but don't let them tell you what to do. In other words, take your freedom or go for freedom. If you have too many rules around you, you're really going to end up living a lie in this utopia that is being promised to you that doesn't exist. And these utopias were caused by intellectuals, which is someone I consider Jordan Peterson to be, but he is just a different animal. And these Jedi mind tricks that they use, not the intellectuals like Jordan Peterson, but it's like a rational mind trick that they're able to spread these meme viruses, feminist viruses, or social justice rule viruses, equality viruses in people's brains that screws them up. In order to fight corruption, just get rid of the rules. Your rules don't apply to me. Rule nine, assume that the person you are listening to might know something you don't. Listen, go talk to your patient, Molly, and have empathy. Quit watching TV and commercials. Go outside with humans. City folk is for emasculated hipsters. Be chill. Be super chillin' like the sleeping elephant and tolerate the conflict. Take your Cuban cigar and chill like Freud and listen. Listen to the patient on the couch. Don't evaluate or judge. Just let it flow and notice how zombies are reactive. Be an active listener. This is a simple chapter. Rule 10. Be precise in your speech. I admire the title of this chapter. The precision, the articulation, be careful what you say, be exact, truthful, and use hard logic in certain cases. Just be blunt, sometimes, especially if they can handle it. And in order to have chaos that does not go crazy, you need to have simple laws or simple orderly ways of saying things. What does it mean broken down to? What is it really somewhat like in framing? What is really going on? And to have the precision of truth or seeking truth is something to be admired. And in a noisy world, find anyone who cares about you and who's blunt with you. Truthful. You should be able to handle this at some point. Not to have thick skin, but to listen. 
Also to understand the other variable of the unknown, the mystery. If we cannot be precise on something, maybe we'll search through what is in the darkness. Also be aware of the destructive power of sins and omission. Say there's an omission of guilt, omission of the truth. People that can spit the game or with a precise razor cut verbiage are to be respected and something to it's a virtue refusing to specify means you're trying to manipulate or there might be something to hide there might be another motive not just someone sliding away on modus operandi and here's a good quote courageous and truthful words will render your reality simple pristine well-defined and habitable this is why the media hates jordan peterson and this is one of the reasons I support this guy. He's got that good vibe, charismatic, caring vibe about him. And here's another quote. It's a, the last paragraph. And he always talks about the being. So here it is. Confront the chaos of being. Take aim against a sea of troubles. Specify your destination and chart your course. Admit to what you want. Tell those around you who you are. Narrow and gaze attentively and move forward, forthrightly. Go forth. Go for it. And he ends it with, be precise in your speech. He's a badass. Rule 11, do not bother children when they are skateboarding. This is my favorite chapter from the book. I read this twice and pretty much this means danger versus mastery. The feminine is safety, security, and being aware of dangers around you. Whereas I would say the masculine would be more assertive and risky, playful, merit, and at the end of the day, competence, not just good enough. You don't want to be caught up into socialism where you really get no merit. No one can really rise above. They're just taken down. It's like a, a religion of envy. And for skateboarding, there's another thing too is parkour. You can admire these people that do these playful things, these risky behaviors, but you're not really taking risks. You're going for mastery and, and competence. It develops a hierarchy. As what we've seen in other chapters is and his YouTube videos is that boys are suffering, that they're not able to even get close to competence. They're put into a safe space, being blamed for not being competent while being tortured in this safe space. And how can you gain any status in a hierarchy when they don't let you? It's a safe space. You should see this as a game, not just as a safe space. There are too many rules and it's good to have a little bit of chaos, a little edginess to you. What's not seen is best unseen. Who cares? And he does talk about the patriarchy and how this is a teardown method of, say, free market versus inequality, domination, and exploitation. There is a science and game of power being displayed. That this is almost a natural order. We want a little bit of hierarchy. There's always going to be a sufferer or a winner and loser. And he does use an example of male shit testing where there is a social way, a little bit of hazing for new recruits at the, say, factory. This is just a test to see if you'll fly with us. It's there's a little bit of banter you can get away with. It's not feminized to be fight club. At the end of the day, boys are always going to be less agreeable than girls. It's a part of the masculine spirits, not the feminine. So radicals should really stop trying to get boys to be agreeable with equality. Let a man get status points for once, especially if he has no game. And this is going to be a problem that he mentions in the chapter is the whole marriage issues going on with females not marrying and guys doing their own thing. That with hypergamy, which he doesn't use the word, is a huge issue. Is eventually going to, the economics for males are obviously going to prove it can't get any worse. It's going to change the dynamic in the future. And another story that he has in this book is called The Tampon King. It's the guy Aruna Chalam. Murungathanam, it's pronouncing his name wrong, but he created some type of napkin, just like tampons, because they called him the tampon king of India. And the point is, these products and inventions that men build help out culture, a culture that always oppresses. It's just natural. All cultures oppress. And it's never being appreciated. Is patriarchy the pathway to happiness? He goes on to talk about Marxism and his opinions. and It's never going to work. There is no utopia. All this in defense of the hierarchy. And at least I live in the United States and not Sweden. Too much protection devastates the developing soul. Test the limits and maybe you should become a free climber. And this is the best quote from this chapter. And this is the best quote from the book, I believe. It's the last of this chapter. And if you think tough men are dangerous, wait until you see what weak men are capable of. I mean, we're going to see this happen and develop these next 20 years or so. It's 2018 and let's see what happens.
Rule number 12, pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. This was a very confusing chapter. I'm going to reread this. I'm going to give you my first opinions on this. For dogs, they're able to be disciplined. They're very easygoing. And they remind you of somewhat of a guy. Whereas cats are a little slick, are a little hard to understand. There's somewhat like a black swan. And for him to say pet a cat when you encounter one is to laugh at the absurdity. Absurdity of life, absurdity of the cat. And why is it scared of you? Why is it acting the way it is? Also, there's a little bit of mystery to cats, a little mystique. They're not social and they're not hierarchical. They cannot be trained such as a dog. And as he says it, they don't do tricks. They are friendly on their own terms. The main point I think he's trying to say is sometimes he wants to be evil to the cat and startle it and scare it because he knows he's going to get that weird reaction from the cat. But if you just let something come to you and you be somewhat kind and you just lower down try to pet the cat you get into something different be inviting i think that's the main thing is don't be arrogant and be inviting to what's around you to listen and i think this is a funny chapter i think he's just trying to deliver a message jordan has a cat named ginger what he puts is in this in the it's written in the book she is low in the big five personality trait of neuroticism which is the index of anxiety fear and emotional pain and whereas some cats they don't have this his cat does not have the neuroticism, such as what James Damore got fired for. That, I think, is the, the message he's, is he's delivering. And he's not really saying it because he's careful with his words. Certain points and certain times in life, you're going to be presented with small opportunities that you shouldn't turn bad toward it or give it a stink eye. If you let these ideas come through, you're going to be rewarded. And everybody else around you will be, too. This concludes my review of 12 Rules for Life. It's a very interesting book. You see another side of Jordan Peterson in this story format as his opinions that were somewhat edited and toned down. So they wanted to keep this intellectual what, but toned down, such as he uses instances of Disney and other examples that are more understanding for, say, the public, since this is a published book. I do recommend this book, as well as I'm going to check out his other book, Maps of Meaning. It's going to cost me like $50, but I'll still do a review of it at some point. And I would check out his YouTube videos. I don't... I have not seen many of his videos. It's all over the internet about what's happened with him. And this guy's a great guy. You can see that in the way he acts and is also in the videos that I've shown during this video. This guy's a great guy. You cited freedom of speech in that. Why should your right to freedom of speech trump a trans person's right not to be offended? Because in order to be able to think, you have to risk being offensive. I mean, look at the conversation we're having right now. You know, like you're certainly willing to risk offending me in the pursuit of truth. Why should you have the right to do that? It's been rather uncomfortable. Well, I'm... Ha, gotcha. And he means well. He seeks the truth. He wants to do the right thing. He may not be, say, as aware of things because he's such an intellectual. He's so deep into the psychology that he's too connected to his own brain. But he's very smart and he seeks the truth and he knows he's being lied to. And he's got this dark humor, very snappy humor. A few people are smarter than this guy, almost. He's got that humor. I'm smart, but I'm also going to listen to you. It's a most definitely good read. Thanks for listening to this review. In the minute we have left, if you could pass on one piece of life advice, and this really is a book of life advice, mm -hmm. uh, to our viewers, what would it be? Stop saying things that make you weak. What does that mean? Well, if you pay attention to what you say, you'll, f you'll know that sometimes you feel like you're standing on a rock, that you're in a solid place, and I suppose that you're speaking from your heart. And other times you're saying things just to look good and just to, um, to buttress your particular status at the time, and that makes you feel weak. You sell yourself out. And if you pay attention to what you say, you can tell when you're making yourself stronger and you can tell when you're making yourself weaker. And unless you want to be weaker, then I would say it's best to say those things that make you strong and you can learn to do that and it's really useful so i would recommend practicing that because it's good for you and good for everyone else too and so there's yep. a there, there's a reason people obsessively watch your youtube videos professor thank you very much for joining us congrats on the book